Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here with you and with our great lineup of speakers talking about media and climate change. Um, there's a lot to talk about when we think about media and climate change from the actual news and how we cover it and how many resources we're dedicating to this most important of challenges at a time when we're also caught up in the day-to-day -day news cycle to also the voices that are legitimate and right in speaking about uh, climate action uh, from journalists to activists to famous people raising awareness, but also applying pressure where it's needed. I do think that COP28, like COP27, COP26, all the COPs previously have seen a change in how expansive the participation is year after year, how much interest there is, not only, of course, because we're feeling the effects of climate change directly, but because this has become a mainstream issue, which really wasn't the case 10 years ago, I think it would have been difficult to have so many people speaking from so many diverse backgrounds on this issue, not only speaking, taking action. So what we want to talk about is how can the media play a role in this effort to combat climate change, but also think about how we continue to cover the story and make sure that we're being factual, accurate, but also informing publics. Um, I'm delighted to be here with all my speakers, I'm going to start with you, Jess, because I want to ask you how, and of course, it's to keep in mind, we've got CEOs here and we've got the managing director of CMA. So I'm not going to go too, too detailed into the editorial side, which is as editor in chief, I would like to, but we'll really talk about also the industry, media industry. But I want to ask you about how you see the role of the media in explaining, breaking down this whole important topic. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And it's so great to be here in Dubai. This is actually my first COP. And I just flew in. Uh, I made this a priority to be here with my team. And media is such an important and plays such an important role in the climate conversation. And in my role as CEO of Time, I'm really proud of the work that our journalists have done. Uh, a couple things that I'll mention just about Time, I just uh, I'm a year in into my into my role. We have the largest global audience in our history at 120 million. We just turned 100, so we're having our centennial. And I know the introduction uh, for the panel was a, a lot about misinformation and disinformation, and uh, it's so important to be trusted and to be respected and well liked, and I would say balanced. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what we're we're doing, especially when it comes to climate. And uh, we have Justin Moreland. He's like, I, I would argue, one of the leading climate journalists um, in America. And uh, we, we have uh, uh, Time CO2, which is our climate action platform. Uh, we have Shyla Ragav here. She's our chief climate officer. I don't know if another media company has somebody like Shyla. So we have subject matter experts um, on the editorial side, but also across the entire organization. And of course, Time 100 just came out, um, really putting a spotlight on different voices and activists, officials, CEOs that are influential in this. So tell us a bit more about Time 100 in terms of how it generated a lot of buzz. Did you expect that? It, it did. Uh, so as I said, we've leaned heavily into climate and it's not just a separate something that we do. It's across everything that we do at time. Uh, we have our uh, Earth Awards, which we launched also this year, and we did our first ever Time 100 Climate Leaders. Uh, and I'm really proud uh, to talk about it here today. What we did, we spent months, um, not just our journalists, but we talked to experts around the world to identify, recognize, and really celebrate who are the most important, influential individuals who are making an impact in climate today. Uh, so 100, we'll do it every year, this was our annual, 45% are women, 60% are international. And it was those that are... Um, driving change, building a better future, but also having measurable results and driving business. So that was the lens and the focus for the 100. And you're going to have people on this list that have been doing climate for decades that are heroes, 
John, Ken John uh, Kerry, we've got Bill and Melinda Gates, um, but we also have those in regulatory uh, areas. We've got those in sustainable luxury fashion. Uh, we've got individuals uh, in design, in activism. It was just a really deep, wide-ranging list. We're really, really proud of it. Uh, we have Stella McCartney, who spoke at our Impact uh, event last night. And if you see what she posted about this recognition, she said that it was the proudest moment for her in her career to be named by time. So that, um, I think, sums it up pretty well. And she also spoke on this forum and spoke about how she was seen as a lone voice. There were lots of people here at COP28, actually, who, who were saying it was lonely, but it's nice now that, the, that it doesn't feel as lonely. So um, she's definitely one voice that's been speaking about this for quite some time. Almar, I want to turn to you. Um, Jess was just speaking about the importance of trusted voices and how important it is for media companies to maintain that trust. But also you gain that trust by ensuring accuracy, data accuracy. Of course, Dow Jones has a series um, of uh, outlets and, and uh, ways of telling these stories. I want to ask you how Dow Jones approaches uh, climate change stories, but also this point about data accuracy, transparency, and how information from media companies like yours plays a role. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, and uh, great to be here. Uh, so trust, uh, as, as Jess indicated, is at the, uh, at the heart of uh, the, what quality media organizations are focused on, and you cannot uh, uh, foster that trust without uh, focusing on facts. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, the energy transition is the story of our lifetime. And we believe that so much that in the past two years, we've invested more than a billion dollars in loading up on data, uh, analytics, uh, expertise. We have more than 650 people who are experts in pricing uh, in different aspects of renewables and uh, uh, hitting all parts of the energy transition. And so uh, that's critical for us. Then at our uh, more mainstream uh, outlets like the Wall Street Journal, uh, you've got dedicated people, a team of uh, probably a, a dozen or so people. Ken Brown is the, the climate editor uh, who's here. Um, but the climate has an, an energy transition more broadly has uh, permeated all of our uh, coverage at, at the Wall Street Journal, at Barron's, at Market Watch, uh, but also in this separate pillar that we've created, Dow Jones Energy. And so uh, I think that contributes uh, to the responsibility that that uh, serious press has mm -hmm. uh, to invest in uh, uh, pursuing facts, uh, creating databases that can then be used by reporters, uh, but also by, by clients and other media organizations. Um, but it's also a great business opportunity. And you know, it was uh, one of the points that uh, uh, Secretary Kerry made in the, in the past couple of days, that there is a, a climate and energy that presents a, a business opportunity. And for us, this is one of our fastest growing uh, uh, commercial endeavors as well. And so it, it's wonderful when those two things coincide. And, and that's the kind of model that you want to have. And I hope more people can, uh, can follow that. And so uh, being factual, it starts by making sure that you have a culture of being factual. That, that um, I always say that one of the best things that we do is when we make a mistake, you know, we correct in, mm -hmm. in public and mm -hmm. owning that. And so having that in your DNA helps. And then making sure that you accumulate uh, data and expertise and make, make sure that that is uh, a permanent presence at, at our company. What we're now seeing is in, the, in the many different parts of our, uh, of our company, um, the, uh, the, the, the different pillars are beginning to work together. So we have the, expert, the experts work uh, with uh, our reporters at the Wall Street Journal. We have people uh, uh, assessing risk, mm -hmm. at, uh, Dow Jones uh, risk and compliance, looking at environmental risk. Now and so uh, it will foster yet new business uh, for us in, in time to come. The, the point you made about uh, data and ensuring that you have that data set because 
clients need it. People are, are asking for that and ways of measurement. It also comes at a time when people are questioning, big pledges are made, big announcements are made, but then a year or two later, how much of that has been delivered? So how, how much of a role do you see uh, your work being as part of that? I mean, that's like, it's a critical part, of course, of, of making sure that just the information ecosystem has to be as clean as possible for people to make good decisions. And that's effectively what our job is. Like we inform people with trusted information to make decisions. And, and so uh, there are a lot of opaque areas, mm -hmm. uh, unclear areas, uh, where we need to shed light. Uh, one thing is uh, so, uh, carbon trade pricing. And actually here um, at, at COP, we have a pilot running with uh, Dubai financial market, um, uh, where we provide carbon pricing, uh, carbon trade pricing, uh, analytics, and news uh, specifically focused on that. And th those are areas where if you don't have reliable pricing, if you don't have reliable information there, uh, then there will be consequences in the market. And, and that's when you can have, in fact, uh, you know, some uh, pledges out there that might not be um, you know, exactly, it might not stack up against a sort of marketing message that comes with it. So, but we, we want to introduce facts and that's, that's our drive. Sid, I'd like to turn to you. Um, we've been talking about media, of course, news, uh, and, and you're involved in business media, but you're also involved in entertainment and also ensuring that there's diverse voices because one of the concerns has been climate and other uh, major global trends are often not reflective of the global story. And it was really important just what you mentioned about Time 100 being diverse, both from the gender perspective, but also a global perspective. So I'd like to ask you about how you see that entertainment, but also diversity being important in uh, the role of media when it comes to climate action. Absolutely. Um, let me start by saying uh, thank you for this opportunity and it's an honor to be here and to speak to the uh, the audience today. Um, I just want to clarify. So we are the founding shareholders and operators of uh, CNBC Africa and Forbes magazine in Africa. So we run a licensed edition and we're present in all 54 countries with headquarters in South Africa and we've got our uh, uh, bureaus in West and East Africa and Nigeria and Rwanda. So that's kind of the the, the background. So um, a lot of my experiences in business media and news production. So let me start firstly by talking about entertainment more from a consumer uh, point of view, because you know we, I think part of what I'm about to say is about the the impact and the power that entertainment has, and that largely comes from being able to tell stories that make it relatable. So if you have an issue, um, you're more likely to take it seriously if you can contextualize it to your life and your experiences. And something like climate change and the impact of climate change impacts absolutely everybody. Um, one of the things that comes to mind, uh, and if you allow me to take examples from uh, you know, cinema, um, I don't know if, uh, if anybody's seen uh, I Am Legend. It's a movie that came out with Will Smith in 2007. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the plot or, or uh, yeah, no spoilers, you know. But uh, essentially, uh, it's kind of a dystopian future where he's the only person left uh, on the island of Manhattan. And then there's this imagery of, um, uh, you know, just the camera pans to basically Manhattan and you see blue whales are swimming and coming up for air uh, in the East River. And I think it's so powerful because it shows you the impact that humanity has had on the environment and then it, the environment's ability to regenerate without humanity. It makes you pause and think, are the, the decisions that I'm making um, uh, positive for the environment. So I think that's something that, that really showcases mm. the, the, the power of, uh, of cinema. Um, kind of like a second point on this, and again, from personal experience growing up, there was a program on television that um, it was a kid's show that focused on um, uh, you know, recycling, and, and I think it was called Captain Planet, and it was, it was very entertaining. And any, any millennials in the, in the audience would probably remember this show. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I think what's really important or impactful about that is that you're speaking to kids at a young age and you're inculcating values of recycling and sustainability um, and just being a, a, you know, a, a responsible citizen. And it's important because you carry that forward as you grow up and then you can impact real change. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the points. There's a 
final thought on this is that you also need to be careful as a media company. At the end of the day, we do have stakeholders and we are for, for profit, largely speaking. Um, one of the issues that we've seen in recent times is Disney's being uh, criticized quite a bit because they're focusing more on messaging than on storytelling. Mm. So just something to keep in mind. Well, it's, it's a very good point to pivot to another point that I had wanted to discuss, which is the issue of advertising. And you're right, because media companies um, have to uh, be profitable and, and be able to continue and uh, running, so to speak. Um, so I'll, I'll continue with you, Sid, if you don't mind. I want to ask you about the point of advertising, because, you know, media companies are often approached by particular industries that have a role, a negative role on climate, but want to speak about what they're doing, about how some of the things are changing and some of it is valid and some of it is not valid. How do you make a business decision about saying, okay, we'll take money from a particular industry that is actually problematic? Do you see that as part of what you should be doing um, in order to elevate their voice? Uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, and unlike Elon Musk, I actually do need advertisers. <laughs> So, you know, um, let's talk a little bit about greenwashing. Now, I took the metro here and um, on the way I saw about, you know, eight or nine billboards uh, on Sheikh Zayed Road with, uh, you know, uh, green energy transition and carbon credits. And, and some of them were extractive industries that were talking about this. So it is a little bit of, uh, you know, you wonder on one hand, um, you're burning hydrocarbons. And on the other hand, you're talking about green energy. So there's a bit of a mismatch. Um, one of the things that we've seen personally is there's a, uh, you know, native content and sponsored content is something that clients are wanting to do more and more of. And it gives them an opportunity to talk about what they're doing in various spaces. And with the build up to COP, we've had a number of clients come in and talk about climate change and things like that. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we're not in a position unless it breaks any laws or it's unethical or outright uh, wrong. We're not in a position to turn it down. But mm -hmm. What I think we should do and what we are doing is in the editorial space that we have in our programming, when we have the CEOs of these companies on, we need to then hold them accountable and say, hey, you put out this ad, but what are you really doing on climate change? Um, there was uh, recently on, on our network, there was um, a company called uh, Just Share, which is a not-for-profit uh, activist shareholder that publishes um, uh, content on and research on uh, um, how the big banks in South Africa are faring on climate change. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, they're not doing very well. Um, but uh, we need to give people like them a platform and the ability to hold the banks and other people that are part of this ecosystem accountable. Mm. Elmar, I want to ask you about this because I think the term greenwashing also has, has pushed some companies not to want to even go public because they feel like anything they do will be actually used against them rather than saying you're doing a good job. So how do we strike that balance by saying, okay, you have a way to go, but at the same time, we acknowledge when, when there is some good stuff happening. Yeah, so first, in the context of advertising, uh, so we have, over the past uh, X number of years, uh, uh, transformed into a digital subscriptions business. Mm -hmm. And so it's predominantly our, our business, which um, uh, so makes that, I suppose, less less of an issue. When it comes to advertising, and, and we still have a, uh, a, a chunk of our business that, that uh, uh, comes from advertising, uh, we have very strict standards, mm -hmm. uh, and they're based around facts. So we fact check the the ads that uh, that run, and that's for any industry, uh, because yeah, there are controversies and 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 questions being asked, of course, uh, uh, across many different industries. So th uh, that's how we have resolved uh, for for that specific thing. Uh, when you're asking journalistically, so sort of how do you strike the balance between what's real and what's not real? I think. That's where you do have to have manpower. You do have to have expertise. You do have to uh, have a long breath when it comes to uh, reporting. It cannot just be uh, like a snapshot of we have one moment. Uh, you got to come back to things uh, again and again. And that's where we're blessed to have big resources and uh, we, we, we can afford uh, that, that longevity of reporting and that depth. Um, and so uh, it's important that we have as many media outlets as possible uh, that actually can do that. Jess, and I want to I want to really pose the same question to you. How do you approach that time? Well, I'm a my background is is commercial on the revenue side. Uh, I am not a journalist, and 
media is a hard business. And I've always done traditional media. I spent five glorious years at the Wall Street Journal, never had a bad day there. And, you know, my, my first role at this company is to make this a sustainable, profitable business. Right. Uh, disclosure, we are owned by uh, co-chairs and co-owners, Mark and Lynn Benioff. And climate is a very personal, big, uh, philanthropic initiative um, for both of them. And, I, you know, I would say for advertising is really important for us. And we work with the, you know, blue chip best brands in the world. Mm. And we're really proud of those partnerships and those relationships we work directly with our customers at the very top CMO and CEO levels. And I think it's a collaborative conversation around, yes, transparency, accountability. We do feel that all voices should be heard and all voices matter. And when you look at the Climate 100 list, that's reflective of also who's on that list. And this is climate is an ongoing and forever project. And it starts now, it starts here. And if everyone does a little, wow, everyone doing a little can add up to a lot. Um, I would say, why is advertising so important? We don't have a subscription business at time. We have a different type of audience. We have the youngest audience in our history, 45% or 35 and younger. They care vehemently about this topic. And they know that they're inheriting a lot of the challenges and they've got to come up with the solutions. And I made the bold and courageous decision. Um, you were there in the room when I made the announcement uh, at our Time 100 gala that uh, we were taking down our paywall. Hmm. So uh, I feel like our purpose and our mission is to tell these stories to a global audience. Not everyone can pay. Not everyone wants to pay. And not everyone wants to get blocked when you get on an article. And I believe that time should be available to everyone in the world and accessible for free. And that's my strategy. That's our mission. That's our purpose. And go to time.com. We have time for kids. We care about news literacy. Yes, we care about trust. Yes, we care about rigorously reported objective journalism. But, you know, in order to get this information into the right people, we don't want to do climate crisis communication. We want to do more solving. We don't want to make it all bright and cheery, but uh, that's sort of the model that we have. I would say uh, a couple of examples. I'll, I'll maybe just uh, choose one. We partnered with um, American Family Insurance. We've been working with them for years, and we're now announcing person of the year. I can't tell you who it is, but uh, tune in uh, next Wednesday, the 6th of December, and it's something we've been doing for, for 95 years. And we collaborated on a program called Dreamer of the Year. Hmm. And during our Person of the Year gala um, with AFI, we talked uh, to Donnell Baird. Uh, he's a local, incredible entrepreneur running Block Power. And he has great dreams in, in the climate startup space, uh, an incredible entrepreneur, uh, man of color. And those are the kinds of things that I think when you look at advertising and how we can continue this conversation and make it really important, uh, those are some of the things that we've been working on. Can I just say the, the urge to go deep into a conversation about paywall or not paywall um, <laughs> is very, very strong, but I will, I will respect that this is a general audience, but we're going to have to continue this conversation because it's, it's one of the biggest questions um, for media companies, but also our industry is going through so many changes. How people consume information, how they're being informed is changing at a speed that we can only keep up, but also we want to get ahead of the curve. So uh, indulge me. I'm going to talk a bit about the industry and then we'll, we'll open up to Q&A. So please prepare your questions. But I want to talk about, um, you know, I think 2023, one of the biggest conversations has been about generative AI. And if we talk about trust, if we talk about sourcing, uh, generative AI raises questions about that and how much can we rely on it or not and so forth. So if we look at a, a way forward, I want to start with you, Jess, how time is thinking about 
generative AI, but also how AI is coming to help in certain newsroom practices. I know for us at the National, there are things that now we can actually turn to, whether it's, you know, how you use a person's voice to um, how we're uh, using machine learning to improve uh, how people are using our website, but also very careful not to bring anything that's generated by AI um, as though it's journalistic practice. So I want to ask you about that. How does time approach generative AI and how do you see the future? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mark Benioff, the chair, CEO, and co-founder of Salesforce, uh, we are uh, independent operationally and editorially from Salesforce. Mark and Lynn own time as a private investment. And with that said, I have spent a, a lot of time in the last year with the Salesforce executives and uh, going to Dreamforce, which was the largest AI event, I think, in, in the world uh, in September. And there's just so much conversation uh, around, you know, promise and progress and excitement and enthusiasm. And then when we talk about media or I get back to time in our newsroom, there's more about peril and challenge and concern and uh, job elimination and, and things like that. Uh, so it's just, it's been very, very interesting. I would say uh, three things. One is uh, we're covering AI like no other media brand. Uh, so we're really excited to make sure that we tell those stories and, again, identify those individuals. Uh, we are probably not doing enough uh, ourselves because we're a little risk averse. We mm -hmm. would rather others go first. Uh, we've seen a lot of others make a lot of mistakes, and we don't want to be in that category. Uh, so we're going a little bit more slowly uh, around how we're going to use AI in our business, in our newsroom. Um, I'm personally excited uh, about some of the tools and technologies just to be smarter, to be more productive. Uh, we're working with Google on a couple of pilot programs where you could take a, a time story and obviously translate it into any language, but you could also make it uh, a version for a third grader or uh, you know, a version for a first grader. So there's like a lot of ways that AI can be really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell one very quick personal story. My son just graduated from the University of Michigan and uh, he was so proud to show me his final uh, paper and assignment that earned him his diploma, which was an eight-page essay on the labor movement in the 1930s. And I know this kid. I'm like, he is not excited about that topic in an eight-page <laughs> essay because he was that kid who came home and he was like, why can't I learn about 401ks? Why can't I read the Wall Street Journal? Why do I have to read Anna Karina or like read about the Greek gods? And he was so excited because he used ChatGPT to do this paper. <laughs> and I said, okay, first, I'm going to strangle you for doing that. Second, I'm going to strangle you for telling me that you did that. But he said, no, you don't understand. The assignment was to use AI. And he was so excited to tell me how he prompts and the outline and the factually reported eight-page essay of which he, he passed. So uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for AI yeah. if we just do it right. And I know we'll follow you smart people. <laughs> uh, have a, who have a lot larger newsroom and a lot of data. So we're going to be looking to you, uh, yeah. what you're doing at Dow Jones uh, and at Forbes. Uh, well, well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Please, Almar, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Tell us how you're going to do it. Well, we're going to take your, your, your ideas. So for your first, w w uh, the coverage, of course, uh, this is, uh, there, there are so many big stories uh, right now, so many crises, so many changes. We live in perma change, right? Uh, that, Generative AI is clearly a, a major story that is that is part of that narrative, and so covering it to the very best of our ability uh, across all of our newsrooms is a is a top priority. And Emma Tucker, our our new mm -hmm. uh, editor in chief, is very much leaning into into that. Um, when you talk about AI from a media company perspective, you get back to the discussion you wanted to avoid, which was uh, about value. So the first principle here is, uh, for us at least, 
that uh, information, and particularly high quality information, has value. And we actually want to install that, mm -hmm. that, that, instill that feeling as well uh, with uh, young users and trained people that information doesn't just happen for free. Quality information doesn't just fall out of the sky. It's very, very costly. Uh, we spent upwards of a billion dollars on, on uh, 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 getting information uh, to, to users. And so how does that connect to AI? Well, the learning models have been crawling. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there is data that has been ingested. Um, that data includes uh, stories uh, from, uh, from many media organizations and basically anything that's been uh, on, on, uh, on the internet. Um, and, and so as those uh, pieces of information are feeding learning models, uh, we are negotiating, and this is, this is public and we've talked about it before, uh, we're negotiating with several media uh, uh, tech platforms uh, to make sure that that value is recognized. Right. And because if you go back to uh, two decades, yeah, there was a huge decision uh, made that you know, information wanted to be free. A, mm -hmm. a lot of newsrooms that weren't uh, uh, perhaps as, as capable as, as time, uh, but local newsrooms in the U.S. went along with that. And the consequence uh, of making everything free at that time was uh, that today there is a barren landscape when it comes to local media reporting, which has hurt local communities, et cetera. And so we are at a moment when that the value of information has got to be recognized. And, and so that's part one, the, the negotiations around, uh, around that, and uh, you know, that's ongoing. And, we, and we're approach, approaching that in a constructive, uh, in a constructive way. Uh, second, uh, this, as Jess indicated, this feeds into workflow. For, it's, it's a work tool uh, for our kids, but also for our, for our newsroom. Uh, it's, uh, it, it will help uh, efficiency. It will help uh, reaching uh, many, many more audiences uh, you know, through uh, translation, for example. Uh, third, uh, it's, it will create new products. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we have several products in the, in the pipeline that will uh, trickle out over, uh, over the next time, uh, the next, the next uh, few uh, quarters. Um, and that will only accelerate. Um, and so these, uh, these products will take different shapes. Some of it is experimental. We're going to have to do a lot of test and learn. I think that is important. We're not just going to put um, everything on, on one particular execution. Um, so it's exciting, uh, but also proceed with caution. Uh, I, I completely agree with Jess that uh, uh, rushing out just to have an announcement around AI, there's just not much use to that, at least not for us. And um, so we're, we're taking it one step at a time, but we have a, a, a large group of people focused on this. Sid, I'd like to ask you, how does CMA Investment Holdings look to generative AI? Um, so, yeah, um, gosh, there's so many ways to talk about this, and I'm trying to hold back the excitement because this is something that I'm personally very excited about, and I've been trying to implement across all of our businesses, not just in, in, in media. But um, on, on the media side and, you know, at the risk of repetition, um, it does augment your ability as a human being. You mm -hmm. can do a lot more. In, you have efficiency gains. Um, so we're trying to get our uh, newsroom to start using it as a tool to at least do the bare, bare minimum and then build from there. And let me give you an example of a workflow that we've recently started experimenting with. And I think the important thing is experiment until you get it right. Um, and that is that, you know, we see ourselves uh, primarily as a legacy uh, a TV station first and then a digital media second. Uh, and that's just a function of the market that we're in at this point in time. So when we produce interviews on uh, CNBC Africa, we um, you know, we then kind of have you know this treasure trove of content, and it takes time for people to kind of you know generate news from that. And then, so one of the things that we're doing is we're taking that video and getting AI to transcribe it, and it mm -hmm. gives you a fantastic transcription. And you know we talk about diverse voices. Try getting a Nigerian or a Kenyan accent or even a South African accent transcribed properly, and you always get mistakes, but uh, OpenAI does a very good job of that. And then it generates a basically a report that you can then use to build on top of. But the important thing here is human in the loop. You can't just take that and publish it because it is full of you know, factual inaccuracies and uh, issues. So it's very important to use it as a base, but then make sure to fact check 
and build on top of it. So that's that's something that I'm um, uh, uh, really excited about, just in terms of process automation and uh, augmenting our, our team's abilities. I like that human in the loop. It's very true. You know, we we have a relationship with Google where we can do simultaneous not only translation but audible of all our. I mean, the national is all in the English language, but we immediately make it accessible in Arabic through a relationship with Google. And I think it's there are different tech companies that you can build a relationship with, but we've always had to work so hard to make sure that one translation accuracy and it's that constant learning um, that they're doing and that we're doing. And I think where you can have collaboration, but at the same time, there's also been a contentious relationship, I think, between media companies and big tech companies. And actually, Time and Salesforce is an, ex an example that many people look to where you can see um, how it can work, but as you said, keeping those, um, those distinctions. Right, so questions and answers. Um, please I, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question and just let us know who you are when you ask your question. We have a roving mic, um, which will come to you. Okay, so we have a lady here and then a gentleman there. So we've got two, thankfully, on the same side of the room. Hi. Um, I'm Ali. I'm a And obviously, as we all know, facts are presented in the form of narratives that include choices made in the background that utopian future of no humans or a utopian future of the world in the harbor. What kind of work do you do before we get to the reporting stage on a particular issue in order to make decisions about the focus area or the I would use the word ideology, but it's not about being, I, I, I know you're not an ideological organization, but there's always I, ideological choices behind the which facts we choose to present and in what way. How do you address that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, if we, if we do have an ideology, it's, it's being factual, right? That, that is our, and, and not to be uh, coy, but that, that is, that is uh, the, 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 the value we hold in the very highest regard. And so pre-reporting, this is where we made these investments to, uh, to make sure that we have data sets that are actually the pricing. There's undeniable trends uh, around that, uh, where we uh, understand sort of intricate, uh, again, financially uh, 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 driven decisions by companies in, in large data sets. And so as much upfront data uh, that, that is proprietary to us, uh, gives us a competitive advantage, but also helps us tell stories that we think uh, are, help society, help people make decisions, uh, but ultimately also then uh, help us grow as a business because we prove greater value. And so I think the more we can upfront uh, uh, equip our, uh, our reporters, our editors, our analysts, and, and really all of our employees with access uh, uh, to, uh, to those proprietary data sets, I think that's critical. The, perhaps superseding that is, is just culture. You, you have to have that culture of accountability that uh, if you have gone too far in one direction that you acknowledge that, whether that's in a headline uh, or making an outright mistake in an article, uh, just owning, owning that and, uh, and, and creating a culture where that's self-declared, where people maybe realize they've made a mistake and and and, uh, and and make sure that their their editors know about it uh, and that that's not something that just gets uh, you know, swept away I think having that and I, I was uh, raised as a reporter at the at the Wall Street Journal those are pretty uh, intense moments when you realize oh well, you've made a mistake right but I think that's where that culture starts it's like how how honest are you around that uh, so if you have created a culture like that, just maintaining that, making sure that, that those values are upheld, we have a very, very strict code of conduct so that your personal behavior and your own uh, perhaps uh, uh, ideological uh, 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 proclivities are not uh, intertwined with your reporting somehow in an explicit way. Uh, and, and so everyone has to, every year, uh, uh, sign that uh, and there's lots of questions that 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 are asked about your 
um, uh, uh, your behavior, whether it's financial or have you had any political activities, et cetera. So that's what you do upfront, create that culture, making sure you have data sets. And then, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think those are some examples. That's great. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Alok Deshmukh. I run a company called Superhuman Race. It's solving for primary reliable impact data. Um, Two-part question, if, if I may. Uh, one is, uh, in your discourse and your narrative, I'm a little disappointed with the title Climate Change, which really should be Climate Crisis or crim Climate Emergency. So what's your position with your company's change or crisis or emergency? Um, and the second question is, as we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and the whole discourse around net zero, I think we all understand the limits and constraints. And we talk about net zero like it's a profit and loss statement, where it actually ought to be a balance sheet. So, yeah. Thank you. That, that felt more of a comment than a, than a question. Um, but, but the first part of the question, was, was your question towards it, it, anyone at the panel? Or we can just, do you want to take a stab at it? So, so change, crisis, yes. Yeah. I'm going to say yes, both. Uh, running media, we have to be really careful in how we tell these stories because we don't want to have again I, I i like a crisis in communication and then you have this i can't read this i it's over i can't there's nothing we can do right. or you feel like things are great and it's fine and it's not going to affect me and so it's a real balance in in our reporting and, and the stories that we tell and it's and it's not easy and uh we again we're sort of spotlighting the solutions um, the individuals, the ideas, uh, we've evolved our business, we've evolved our brand, we've evolved our journalism. Uh, we use the sort of tagline around building a better future. So we are trying to personalize these stories, again, in a way that is about me, right? Because at the end of the day, climate is about us. It's not really about the planet. We need the planet for us, for us as people. I believe personally that once you become impacted yourself, and you mentioned a balance sheet, once you become impacted yourself in your community, in your family, and in your wallet, you get you take action. And we need more people to take action. And that's just the way it is. It's just, it is. And with climate events happening regularly, globally, everyone's gonna be impacted. And they're gonna take action. And so it's, it's a balance, and we, I see Justin's here in the audience. Hi. Uh, and, and he's an incredible leader of all of our climate content. Uh, he could speak to it better than I could, but that's sort of my position. Great. Thank you. Um, question here, please, and then we'll go. Okay. Hi, uh, Alex Javrankov. I run a company called Insilico Medicine. We do AI for drug discovery. Uh, but um, by the way, first, I wanted to comment that the fact that we have empty seats in this panel is shocking because uh, the role of media, I guess, it's the most, um, uh, is the most important uh, feature that drives uh, you know, us towards uh, fighting climate change. Uh, but my question is on generative AI. <laughs> uh, great uh, question, uh, Mina. Um, uh, but I don't think it was fully answered. Um, I, I, I have two questions. So one is, um, are you planning to introduce your own conversational tools in, in the near future, either Time or Wall Street Journal? And uh, uh, also, how do you ensure accuracy uh, with generative AI, because at some point in time, the journalists will use the tools, and uh, they are becoming increasingly valuable because you can crawl the entire internet and provide real-time reporting with high accuracy. So my question is, how do you achieve accuracy? Even in climate change, you can do like, immediate real-time reporting. Yeah, so uh, I'll go first to... Um, on first, we... we, we 
we want to walk slow when it comes to using uh, new tools and then making them public facing. Uh, uh, so there's no rush, whether that's a tool that, uh, that a reporter uh, uh, might use uh, and then the product of that uh, appears um, in the publication. Uh, the, 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 the newsroom is reasonably conservative uh, uh, around that. And so there's still a fact checking process before anything uh, reaches a, uh, a, a reader. So there are uh, editors who look at, uh, at stories. So that at this point uh, uh, has, has not gone away. Um, uh, even if you look at simple things uh, with, with generative, uh, you, um, for example, translations. You know, so uh, translations can be really good. I think as you just uh, indicated, uh, for some uh, languages, for, for others, sometimes the nuance is missing. Um, we uh, we do see examples where uh, uh, generative AI, uh, when working with uh, interacting with uh, human intelligence, uh, works really well. Uh, one of the things that we do at Dow Jones uh, uh, in our risk uh, arm is uh, to look f identify financial criminals uh, or human traffickers, uh, and we do that for corporate clients um, and and so on. And we have found that um, as, a, as a human, we, we have uh, quants and researchers in Singapore and Barcelona and Princeton, uh, uh, hundreds of them looking at large data sets. Uh, on their own, they can draw certain conclusions uh, and move at a certain pace. But uh, with generative AI and the, the ability to summarize, they can access far larger data sets. And so, uh, we've had uh, situations where uh, financial criminals very often set up shell companies uh, and fronts and uh, uh, fake websites where uh, there was a, an a HR company uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia um, that uh, the human researcher suspected of not being uh, uh, up to snuff. Uh, but they couldn't really prove it. So then they used generative AI for massive data set uh, and found out that uh, there were uh, corresponding phone numbers and, uh, and email addresses on another site that a human could simply not have found because the data set was way, way, way too large. And so they connected these two things and found out that the HR site was actually a human trafficking site. And, uh, and so we call that approach authentic intelligence, where, where we bring the human and, uh, and, and the machine together. And so we hope to see more of that, not just in that very specific business, but, uh, but I, I imagine that our reporters, our editors, over time, they're gonna have very, very powerful tools at their disposal where hopefully we can you know, unveil uh, a lot more criminal behavior uh, and, and introduce just more facts in, in, into the world, so. Sid, you said you were quite excited about generative AI. So if you can address those, one, do you plan to introduce uh, sure. tools, but also uh, ensuring accuracy when used? So I, I think um, at this stage, we're not planning on doing anything public facing. And that's largely because of the occasional inaccuracies that you get. And it would be irresponsible for us to do so. So it is an internal loop. And as I said earlier, um, human in, internal tool and human in the loop is important. So nothing goes out without somebody double checking and fact checking. Um, so that's current, currently where, where we stand. But one of the opportunities that we see, well, it's a threat and an opportunity. Um, the issue right now is that these large language models are developed by a few companies and they have, um, uh, they're have they still figuring out their business models. And we saw what happened with OpenAI over the last couple of weeks. Um, my fear, if we continue building with these products, is that they might turn around and change the pricing model, availability, data sets, things like that. So one of the things that, um, I think media companies or anybody who has large amounts of data should be doing is developing their own large language models and training their own data. And we have a repository of you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, articles that have been written over many years. Um, same with video content. And I think that's something that we would potentially be looking at in the future is building our own LLM. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Jonathan Hawkins from uh, a small media startup called CNN. Um, you mentioned, Alma, earlier on about the uh, the barren landscape of local media and the importance of 
local journalism in terms of the climate crisis. I'm just wondering if you see any hope of reseeding that barren landscape and um, you know what can be done to reinvigorate local journalism, particularly on this crucial topic, given its importance. Yeah. So I am, in spite of that earlier comment, I'm, I'm quite optimistic um, on the long term uh, about uh, local media. And, and here's why. Uh, the barren landscape also translates into an opportunity. And what we do know, when you look at the, the VIX, the fear index, you know, for what we see uh, in our readership, of course, uh, each time there is a crisis, we see uh, more people, of course, coming to the site, as you would at, at CNN, but also uh, more, more demands, uh, subscriptions and, and the like. And so we know that people crave factual information. And so the, the trick is to make it available. There is a market there. And what encourages me is that you now see a proliferation of uh, private uh, initiatives, more startups, um, uh, more journalists who have been sort of pushed out of the mainstream system, but who have expertise, who have local knowledge, who might have very narrow uh, knowledge about uh, certain aspects of a community. Um, you see them step forward and they're experimenting. So you see actually a, a, a beautiful uh, 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 mosaic of um, uh, uh, different initiatives uh, and different uh, almost tests live experiments taking place um, all over uh, the U.S., but also uh, outside, uh, outside the U.S. And so something is going to translate, I'm confident, into a, a model uh, that works. And you can see that you know, it's not exactly local reporting, but there's, for example, um, you know, uh, legal experts that, that can do really factual uh, reporting, can break uh, stories, uh, have scoops, and uh, uh, find an audience uh, for that that is you know, either willing to pay or there is an advertising model around that. And so if you see that wherever we see a narrow, focused uh, uh, information that creates value for, for somebody, I can make a decision based on this. You know, there is a business model there uh, somewhere. And so we have found that out for industrial verticals and different focus areas. I'm convinced that within a local context uh, that, that, uh, that will exist as well. Thank you. There's a question here. I'm going to ask you to please keep it very short because we're going to run out of time. Okay. Uh, my name is Fahad. Uh, I represent Arab News in Saudi Arabia. Uh, first of all, thank you for such great discussion. Uh, my question is for Jessica. You spoke about uh, how you removed the paywall. So what's your take on on this argument that says that if you, want, if you value quality journalism, you have to pay for that? And uh, because that also enables you know, the writers and journalists, uh, give them more resources to, to work for it. Okay, thank you. Je I'm going to ask just this gentleman to ask his question, and we'll, we'll group them together just okay. for time. Okay. Uh, gentleman at the back, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Shuva. I'm founder of uh, Eneros Global Energy, and uh, we are setting up a special purpose media fund to uh, uh, you know, jumpstart uh, the startups uh, that are you not know, trying to use media uh, for uh, you know, acting as a tool for uh, climate change. So my question uh, is to uh, Sid, uh, like uh, how do you see uh, investment you know, in an arena? Uh, uh, like um, you can use media for uh, as a tool for climate literacy and uh, I will have a small comment that it's a very you know, nice topic and uh, we can think of a lens like uh, money, mind and media. This is the 3M that uh, should be the lens for the climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Jess. Yeah, uh, so for time, uh, this was the right business model and approach for for our brand. Um, it was not. It was a courageous and bold decision because clearly everyone else is going in the opposite direction. I made the decision for time. Uh, number one, uh, it it wasn't working for us. 
we're not the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg. We have a very different audience. We have a very different model and we have different journalism. And we're a hundred year brand. And we talked a lot about trust today and a hundred years of trust, it takes one, one mistake to, to lose that. And the, the, the red border is globally recognized as that trust and we need that now. So that's our mission and that's our purpose. And if we're going to stay around for another 100 years, like, we want to stick to what our mission is and what our purpose is. And it really lent itself to that. The second is, this is a little bit of your gut and a little bit of, I've been in the traditional legacy media space my entire career. It's the only thing I've done. And I just saw that this isn't working. And this isn't working not just for time. I just went first and I just said the truth. But it's not working for Netflix. It's not working for Hulu. It's just the subscription business had a huge moment and it's still going to work for the Wall Street Journal. It's still going to work for the New York Times, but it's not going to work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I saw my own behavior during COVID. I had like 20 things that I was reading. And then all of a sudden I wasn't reading 20. I was reading five and I didn't want to pay for all 20. And I think that that's where consumers were headed. I saw this coming. That was my gut. And the third thing is kind of what's going on in the U.S. with the FTC, which is click to buy, call to cancel. So click to buy it, you're done, but you can't get anyone on the phone when you want to cancel. And I think a lot of the credit cards are complicit. So you're getting these recurring fees that you just don't really know about or you don't want. And so, again, it's, it wasn't the right decision for, for all of media. It was just the right one for, for time. And I'm really proud of, of where we landed. Right. Our time's up. But Sid, I'm going to ask you to um, just respond to that one question before we wrap up. I'll try, I'll try and be quick. So I'll just use your comment as, um, uh, as a starting point for, for the response. So the most important thing you mentioned, in my opinion, is money, right? And that's when um, you kind of contextualize a problem and, and uh, make it relevant to, to people and education as part of this, is that how does climate change impact my wallet? And is that through my livelihood? Is that through my way of life? So I think that's something as, um, as a business media channel we do well because uh, we're already seeing the impact of climate change uh, on uh, things like flash floods and crop yields uh, and things like that. So I think that really does uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, make it very important and urgent uh, for people. This has been a great panel. Thank you. From the responsibility of climate coverage, investing the resources in people and abilities and data sets to trust the value of information, but also the business opportunity that we have as media companies with covering this all important climate crisis, climate change, climate action. Important to make stories accessible and relevant and thinking about our audiences and who they are. We're lucky to be living in an era where we actually know more about our audiences. You know, before we used to print a newspaper, put it out there and hope that the editor's decision was right. Now we know if it is or it isn't. And of course, the speed of change of what we're witnessing. Important to talk about subjectivity. I think rather than ideology, we're all subjective. We chose to be in this panel rather than the 20 other panels that are happening. Subjectivity and what drives us, what moves us. And in the end, how climate change is impacting us as individuals and therefore our responsibility as media people to make sure that we're covering that story. Thank you very much for your insights and for your time. Please, a round of applause to our panel. Thank you.